Hey everybody, Joe here from the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. If you enjoy what we do here on the show and you think it's worth your hard-earned money, you can support the show via Patreon. Just a $1 donation gets you access to bonus episodes, our Discord, and regular episodes before everybody else. If you donate at an elevated level, you get even more bonus content. A digital copy of my book, The Hooligans of Kandahar, and a sticker from our Teespring store. Our show will always be ad-free and is totally supporter-driven. We use that money to pay our bills, buy research materials that make this show possible, and support charities like the Kurdish Red Crescent, the Flint Water Fund, and the Halo Trust. Consider joining the Legion of the Old Crow today. And now back to the show. Hello, and welcome to yet another episode of the Lines with my Donkeys podcast, Chechen edition. I'm Joe, and with me again is Nick. Not a local uh, Chechen expert. Yeah, lo- local expert of the Chechen Republic of Ichkara. That's why we hired you, Nick. Just for this. What episode are we on? We've been doing this for three years, and we figured we would give you time to warm up on your expertise on the region that you, uh, you graduated with a doctorate from uh, from Grozny University. I don't know if that's a school. I assume there's a university in Grozny. I don't dabble in any of this. <laughs> I, I only dabble in uh, uh, Dagestani law. Um, anyway, we're in part two of the First, Ch- first Chechen War. Uh, and when we left you last time, Russia had finally committed to invading the small breakaway Republic of Chechnya, formerly known as the Chechen Republic of Ichkeria. Uh, but uh, as we kind of spoke ahead of ourselves at the end of the last episode, things were not that easy. Now, for about seven-ish hours, we already talked about the Soviet army as it was deployed in Afghanistan. How are you feeling about the capabilities of that military, Nick? Um, I feel like they're going to look big and scary at first, and then uh, all of a sudden shit just starts falling apart. Yeah, it's pretty accurate. Rather than retreading that territory, if you're new to the show or whatever, I highly recommend you go back and listen to at least one or two of the episodes where we talk about that, because all of those problems are still there. Instead of them being fixed by the Soviet military no longer being a thing, and this now being the Russian military, which you think would be easier for them to retrofit or modernize or do something to to fix all these problems. It's only worse now. So same, same. I would have rather been a soldier in the Red Army in Afghanistan than the Russian Army in Chechnya. Really? That's insane. The general quality of life is... We'll, we'll talk about that at length here in a little bit. Oh, we're doing another soldier quality of life? <laughs> Not <laughs> so, really. Um, we're, we're just going to talk about the realities of life as a normal soldier in Russia in 1994. Uh, and honestly, being in Russia generally in 1994 is not a good time of their history. So like being a conscript in this military, even worse time. Now, as you can imagine, Boris Yeltsin believed that this would not be that much of a military adventure. Like, you didn't see this as a war. Say you're deploying tens of thousands of soldiers and all of the logistics involved in that effort. How long do you think you want to give your chiefs of staff, your defense ministers, and things like that? And not to mention, remember how big Russia is, how hard it's going to be to right. draw all those forces there. How long do you think you want to give these guys to figure this out? Like a couple months, a I, year? I would say like six months to a year. Because we're talking like the you 90s. Got 14 days, Nick. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you got 14 days. That Boris Yeltsin wanted not only plans hashed out and complete but he wanted soldiers staged and ready to march within 14 days. Mm, that's a time crunch. Yeah. I don't know if this is something that like the U.S. or Russia would be capable of now. Uh, not in this capacity. Like we uh, Both nations, obviously, us a little bit more than they, uh, have the ability to rapidly deploy soldiers in various parts of the world. But a full invasion with within 14 days uh, with tanks and APCs and jets and helicopters and all these other things, it's a big fucking ask. Oh, yeah. Since the fall of the USSR, the vaunted Red Army had gotten their shit kicked in in Afghanistan and fallen into disrepair. This is a fact that was not a secret. This is not something that was like hidden away. It was 
very well known and acknowledged by several people within the government, including the chairman of the State Duma Defense Committee. Outside of politicians, senior military leadership also believe that this entire plan to invade Chechnya was absolutely batshit insane. Well, at least they know. Yeah, like, uh, unfortunately, he gets down to the yes men, <laughs> which is oh, bad. Okay. Yeah. Now, they point out that they might be able to invade Chechnya. That's not the big ask. The thing is, they need more time and they need more money because they need to train all of these new recruits that they're getting. They're in cycles of conscription. A lot of these new conscripts simply haven't been trained yet. They were all disregarded, despite the fact that many of these soldiers sent to units where they would receive absolutely no formal training before their upcoming deployment to Chechnya. Now, it's a long time ago, but you know we talked about the Red Army going to Afghanistan. Now, someone's probably said, well, it wasn't technically the Red Army. It was the Soviet ground forces. Shut up. Everybody knows it was the Red Army. <laughs> At least they got training. It wasn't great, but like they knew how to use the rifle. A lot of the conscripts that would cross the border into Chechnya had never fired their rifle before. Many of them mm. like would not get ammo up until the point they deployed. What? Yeah. They just they just didn't have any fucking money. They're like, yeah, we, we have ammo, but you know, we have what we have we have weapons, but all the ammo is gone, or all the rifles are gone. Commander sold them. Ask your buddy how to use it. Yeah. He doesn't know either. Well, trickle down knowledge of rifle marksmanship. Yeah. Remember how I said all of the systemic issues, the just insane, violent uh, hazing, still there, in rank slavery, still there, just outright theft, even worse. Well, at least they kept that tradition going. That is one thing they did keep over. And like, that's actually still kind of a problem today for things that I've read. Yeah, Uh, it's not as bad. They've almost fully transitioned to a professional contract military, which began being a thing in this war. They were called contract Nikki and where you could sign a contract and, you know, start a career rather than be a a conscript. Uh, There's a very good book called One Soldier's War by Arkady Babchenko, and he was a conscript during the first war and a contract Nikki during the second. Just liked it so much. It's a lot of the same kind of stuff that American veterans deal with, or like he just did not know how to become a person anymore. So he's like, I might as well go back to war. He's had a very weird life, but there was just like outright hatred between the contract Nikki and the conscripts. They stole from each other. Shit like that. Like there was outright murder and hazing and violence. Yeah, it's crazy. All of these things exist in the 70s and 80s. They exist again now in 1994. And remember how we talked about the last episode? A lot of these fucking guys simply have gutted their own armies, like the commanders and stuff, to line their pockets. The equipment availability, readiness, and quality is all markedly less than it was in Afghanistan, uh, despite the fact that it was decades ago. Right. Okay. Now, it was around this point that around 500 officers were fired or demoted for Jesus. opposing the invasion of Chechnya. Another 800 refused to take part, with 83 of them eventually being brought up on charges for it. Still others voluntarily quit, including the Deputy Minister of Defense, Boris Gromov, who is a hero of the Afghan war and of the Soviet Union. Oh, wow. Yeah, Gromov said that the war would be a, quote, a bloodbath, another Afghanistan, on live television. Which... Turns out he was right. Not a lot of fans. No, no, uh, definitely not. That, that's how I says like he got down to the yes men because they're like, look, you're either going to draw up these plans or your career's over. And a lot of people are like, I'd rather my fucking career be over. You're not paying me anyway. That actually sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I'll take my fucking walking papers. Fuck <laughs> yeah. you. And other people point out the legal problems involved in this war. Remember, Chechnya is legally part of Russia. This would be like us deploying the U.S. Army to invade Oklahoma. It's illegal. You can't do that. And you know, people point out, like, actually deploying the military against their own civilians is explicitly against the Russian Constitution, right? Mm. Now, thankfully for Boris Yeltsin, nobody ever let something called, like, the law stop them from doing a war. See, that's what I like. That's a go-getter. He didn't even ask Parliament for approval. He just, don't need he just it. invaded part of the yeah, country. You don't need it. Apparently. Don't need it. You know, law, order, constitutions. It's all more of a vibe. Those are just like, how, how, how do you say with those, uh, those old uh, packing lists? It's optional. <laughs> all of these things are optional. All of the, the social construct of a nation state is just more of a suggestion. Now, that's when General Vorboyev, who is the deputy commander of the Russian ground forces, was sent to... Mazdak, which is very close to the Chechen border, to 
kind of oversee operations but for planning and you know planning logistics things like that for the upcoming operation and what he saw left him virtually speechless it was so badly thought out and planned he called the entire military operation a quote sheer adventure oh nice in response, he was told to turn his resignation paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, sweet. He's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> Afterwards, he began to publicly shit talk his old boss, saying Defense Minister Pavel Gretchev had lacked the courage to tell President Boris Yeltsin that his troops were woefully unprepared for the invasion. Now, this might be true. Also, in the last episode, I mistakenly called Pavel Gratchev Boris Gratchev. It's Boris is all the way down. I apologize. He's not, in fact, one of them. He's a Pavel. Gratchev was seemingly the one person who did not oppose the war, and he just so happened to be the only person that Yeltsin would listen to. Like I said, he's someone we've talked about before, years ago. Gratchev was known, even then, as a notoriously corrupt asshole who was terrible at his job. Someone said that he was Boris Yeltsin's personal defense minister because he never left like Yeltsin's side, which is not his job. Mm. He was a yes man. He was given the sarcastic nickname Pasha Mercedes due to his level of obscene corruption and the wealth he had illegally obtained due to selling off Russian and East German weapon stocks. Oh, wow. And he owned personally like a dozen Mercedes. <laughs> Like, he didn't even try to hide it. And everybody fucking do it. Are they all different colors? Like, I hope so. I'm going to assume, looking at him and how he operated, they're all black with tinted windows. I was thinking, like, a boring gray. He might have a gray. I feel like that this is solid Russian mob blacked out type mm, shit. I could see that, too. Just all of them? All of them and all driven by matching former police officers that are, like, bald and hairless and kind of look like human thumbs that, as personal drivers. Like an Agent 47. <laughs> That's what I was... I was thinking of Agent 47 like a in a Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is Agent 47 if Agent 47 melted like a candle. Yeah, Agent 47 is real smooth. <laughs> He's a very svelte boy. Pavel Gratchev was also very well known for being blind drunk all the time. Uh, he drank at work uh, and there was also... Uh, a fair amount of evidence, though, I will say, allegedly here, not that he can sue me. He's dead. Yeah, he's dead. <laughs> Let me double check my sources. That he was like alcohol dependent uh, and suffered from withdrawals if he didn't drink all the time. And actually, same rumors for Boris Yeltsin. Uh, really? <laughs> yes. So they would all just suffer the shakes together at work. There was also the time he almost certainly ordered a couple of his airborne officers to murder a journalist who was uncovering his corruption while he was stationed in East Germany. What the fuck? When the Berlin Wall fell, now a lot of East Germans' vehicles and weapons were left behind, which led to a very weird situation when they merged the former People's Army of whatever East Germany was officially called. I'm, gonna, I'm going to spitball here and say the People's Democratic Republic of Germany. Because I feel like that fits the naming conventions, East nice. Germany. A lot of those would be uh, like kept by uh, the Bundeswehr for like target practice or be sold off because there's just so many of them. But other of them were just stolen and sold. A lot of them by Gretchen. <laughs> the, the guy literally made an incalculable <laughs> amount of money doing this. Nobody's sure how much money he made, but it's assumed it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Jesus Christ. A journalist who's a pretty young guy uh, was uncovering this because the man's very stupid, uh, Gratchev is. He's not good at anything. The only thing he was good at was becoming a general and putting himself in the position to be able to rob East Germany blind. He left evidence everywhere. Fucking everywhere there's evidence. So like this journalist found it and Gratchev was originally a, an airborne commander before he's defense minister. And their airborne, much like our airborne, is kind of a cult. And <laughs> so like his officers oh, okay. listen to him yes. more like like a mob boss than a general. So he's like, hey, they're cutting it on our hustle. And that guy caught a whole bunch of bullets in the face. Really? I think they they caught one of them, but he was like found not guilty or something like that. I was kind of hoping that they when officers say, no, that's wrong. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Weird how that happens. Didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> his success and elevation to defense minister had absolutely nothing to do with his skill, but rather his friendship and personal loyalty to Boris Yeltsin, who backed and protected him from any blowback or punishment from all of his various crimes, of which there are just so many. <laughs> like, 
That's friendship. Well, the thing was, as Yeltsin, it was handy to have a defense minister who was a spineless yes-man and owed things to you, as you can tell, because without Grachev, this war doesn't mm. happen. Like, any other defense minister who Yeltsin didn't have just, like, an endless amount of dirt on would have been like, no, this is fucking stupid. And on the flip side of that, people have said that, like, Grachev probably had dirt on Yeltsin, too. It was, like mutually assured blackmail destruction in this circumstance like they're both pointing guns at each other yeah but yeah they don't know that they're pointing guns at each other but they both know that they might be pointing guns at each other yeah and like when there was the damn near civil war that yeltsin ended up coming up on the the right side of grachev like had no compunction about like rolling tanks through the downtown moscow and and helping out his friend so like yeltsin was indebted to him and Gratchev, well, both of them are corrupt dickheads, but Gratchev was a incredibly corrupt dickhead. Like, look, I'll keep making sure nobody fucks with you, but you have to overlook the fact that, like, I sold East Germany. <laughs> 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 and Yeltsin's like, deal, friend. So when Yeltsin told Gratchev that he wanted to invade Chechnya, Gratchev's like, yeah, sure, fuck it. Let's, let's, let's do it. Let's invade. Do you think they got stuff to sell? They have oil. Mm. <laughs> so like, I'm willing to bet in the circumstance where Russia wins, which, spoiler, they don't, to Gratchev steals a lot of oil money, too. Absolutely. Now, he had a rough idea of the readiness condition of the Russian military, mostly through secondhand knowledge, because he never left Moscow and hardly ever visited soldiers or talked to their commanders. He believed that that was below him, but he did know things weren't good. Hell yeah, fuck them. <laughs> hey, you in the uniform, fuck you in particular. It was hard to dodge the knowledge of how bad off the Russian military was. Just two months before the war, Grachev told the Russian parliament, quote, no army in the world is in such a poor state of ours. It is a sin to keep it half starved and destitute. <laughs> two months before the war. <laughs> Truly incredible. Now, uh, in reality, the military he was in command of was truly in total shambles. No division size training uh, or any kind of training exercise above the, I, I think it was the regimental level, had been done since 1992. And since it was 1994, oh. you have to look at like the reality of the quality of soldier you're dealing with here. You know, so like in the US, obviously, we weren't alive for conscription, but like on the low end, I think I saw contracts for like three and a half years when I enlisted. That was pretty common, right? Now they're a little right. bit higher. But like, you know, if you hadn't done something in two years, that's kind of crazy. But also you generally have a third or fourth or a fifth year, sometimes even a sixth year, depending on what your MOS is, to catch up on that. It's not super uncommon for someone to to learn a skill they haven't done in like a year because you'll still be there, right? Unless you have short timers, in which case, whatever. But because it had been two years since a large-scale training exercise in Russia, that meant not a single soldier within the ranks had any large-scale training because they would only be drafted for 24 months. Oh. So by the time the last soldiers of 1992 trained, by 1994, they're all out. They're all right. gone. Now, there is a very small minority that stay over their conscription period to become NCOs and warrant officers and stuff. But the number is fucking minuscule because, remember, being a conscript sucks. Oh, and yeah. being in the military is not great. Babchenko pointed out one of the reasons why the contract Nikki were so vicious and awful is because who in their right fucking mind is going to volunteer to do this, right? So a lot of them were criminals running away from shit they didn't do exactly a lot of background checks some of them were like serial murders and rapists Jesus. <laughs> so like yeah like like not surprising but god <laughs> right right and because of bad record keeping a broken mobilization process and widespread draft dodging most units were about half strength solid like draft dodging became so easy and commonplace to do that like people just stopped trying to enforce it <laughs> you know there was political officers and stuff like that in place during the soviet union that could go to like your local neighborhood and force you into going to the draft office like the local commissar was a thing granted by the Soviet war in Afghanistan, they did not have that much power anymore, but they still kept people in line and made them go to draft offices for fear that like the local political officers are going to come to your door and harass you or possibly throw you in prison. So like, yeah, I'm going to go register at the draft office. They both sound awful. Now those motherfuckers are gone. The Communist Party is dead, right? So like all right. of these functionaries are gone. So people are like, wait, I can just 
fucking keep going to work. <laughs> Nobody's going to come bother me. <laughs> or just like move to the next town over and change your address. Like nobody was keeping track. Or we could keep in time the good old uh, fake mustache and glasses combo. <laughs> Ah, I see you're looking for uh, Ivan. Well, as you can tell, I have the rather large nose, glasses, and mustache. That can't be me. And like, ah, uh, yes, you're right. Have a good day, sir. Uh, and also <laughs> bribes. Uh, a lot of people were bribing their way out. Those are still super common. Now, we already talked about how training was dog shit or just mostly non-existent, honestly. Most people were drafted and then they would just simply try to survive. There wasn't exactly a lot of military life going on. Other than the fact that you wore a uniform and had to live in a barracks. Like, I can't imagine, like, if you're not training or you're not getting paid, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> uh, mostly indentured servitude. Uh, <laughs> now, remember how I said everybody's broke, right? Even officers are broke. Right. Uh, and this was a thing in the Soviet times, and it was definitely a thing in the 90s, and I think it probably still exists today, is that officers would rent you out for labor. Oh. Local construction companies or local rich people or local people with money generally, like, we need humans. And the officers are like, I have a large supply of people who cannot legally tell me no. How much money do you have? <laughs> and like soldiers end up working construction sites. They end up being like butlers doing other more nefarious, awful things uh, and making absolutely no money of their own. It would all go to their officers. And if you know, you say no, like... I'd hold out a tip jar. Be like, how about like, fuck you, sir. I'm not going to go dig a ditch. She's like, well, I have the guys who have six months left on their draft time. They're going to literally murder you if you don't. And I'm not going to prosecute them. Like, ah, I'll see you at the dig site then, sir. <laughs> They weren't training, but outside of not having any money for training, they also didn't have any money for housing or food. Remember, the Soviet Union was fucking huge, and a, a lot of the soldiers within the Soviet Union were Russian. And these soldiers happened to be stationed abroad. Now, when the Soviet Union collapsed and various Soviet republics became their own independent states, a lot of them took control of their local units. Others did not. Others, sometimes Russia's like, no, that's mine. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of units are being pulled back within the borders of the Russian Federation. And suddenly they have no fucking place to live, right? Because they've never been historically stationed. They're like, this unit's been stationed, I don't know, fucking Kyrgyzstan for the last 30 fucking years. We have nowhere to put them. Well, we have to build more barracks. Well, we have no money to build barracks, so you guys figure it out. So this made soldiers <laughs> quite literally homeless outside of their own bases because they, they had nowhere to live. Other places, they were at mercy for like just the local townspeople to like let them hot couch, you know? And in other places, uh, like officers stole supplies to sell to get their soldiers a place to live. Though that was not as common as you'd hope because they're officers. Right. Makes sense. Russian pilots forced by cuts and a lack of fuel and replacement parts might not fly at all every month. For in case you're one of like, you know, most pilots have to fly a certain amount of hours every month to stay certified. I believe in the US at the time, it was like 20 hours a month. And in Russia, a lot of them simply weren't getting any time at all to fly and others were getting like an hour a month. Like I said, officers are pawning off their equipment, selling vehicles to probably mobsters and, and weapons dealers so they can feed their soldiers. I got this sweet jet. How much rice can I get for this tank? <laughs> <laughs> This led soldiers to have to forage for food in their own country in 1994. Uh, like someone pointed out that like there was a journalist, I think he was from like Germany, and then he went over to Russia to see this. And he said that it looked like something out of like 1812 when <laughs> Napoleon invaded. That you'd see a whole bunch of soldiers like picking berries and like grass out in the field. They're fucking doing like bushcraft yeah, shit. They have no food. They're like, ah, I could eat this tree. <laughs> Now, the thing is, this all has blowback, right? Like, you can't pump hundreds of thousands or millions of people through this system and not expect it to have some kind of, like, trickle-down effects. People got drafted and eventually went home, assuming they didn't get murdered by their fellow draftees or, I don't know, disappeared by their boss. And they would tell people how fucking awful being in the military is, which, of course, led more and more and more people to dodge the draft. The draft dodging problem was even greater than it was during the Afghan war. So like, really? yeah, and like that was just an incredible amount of draft dodging. Yeah, but then you get those weirdos that are like, you know what? That sounds awesome. Let me go fucking sign up. No, that's 100% true. There's a lot of people who wanted to go fight and win 
uh, like valor and honors and stuff in Afghanistan. There, it certainly did not outweigh the amount of people that they were missing from the ranks, though. Now, none of this stopped Gratchev from telling Yeltsin that he would end the war within a couple of hours with a single airborne regiment. Nice. And he also called it a, quote, bloodless blitzkrieg. Those are the two most incorrect statements, I think, in this entire series. Those two words together? Bloodless blitzkrieg? Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, fucking for virginity or bombing for peace, right? <laughs> he also personally met with Dudayev. Remember, he's the president of Chechnya. In December, the same month the war would start, and said, mm. not to worry, there would never be a war between Russian citizens, right? Like, we'll figure this whole thing out. Oh, he did the old cross your fingers thing behind the back. Yes. It doesn't count. I, see. I crossed my fingers and said, no takesy backsies. You bastard. <laughs> Dude, I was like, fuck, I didn't think of this. <laughs> yeah. Nose goes. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> but there was going to be a war. Yeltsin listened to Krachev, assumed the war would be over rapidly after a surgical strike. And to their credit, it kind of seemed that way when the war began. On December, it was surgical. It did at first. I'll give them that much. To be fair, it's really easy. Uh, on December 11th, Russian jets bombed every combat and civilian aircraft, fixed or rotary wing, in Chechnya, rendering the entire air force completely useless as well as the civilian fleet. That is one surgical strike they carried out. It would also be the last. I honestly thought that their definition of surgical strike was well, we started the. Like on the day. That's good. We started at like, you know, three hours late on the 11th. Normally, Russian surgical strikes require like, I don't know, 18 hour long artillery strikes. But like they did destroy the entire Chechen Air Force. But Dudayev let them. He knew that he was not going to be able to fucking dogfight it out with the Russian Air Force. He was not going to be able to continue to supply or reload these planes. All a fucking pipe dream, right? Those were free anyway. <laughs> they were kind of. Uh, and the thing is, we know this because Dudayev knew this was all coming. And to this day, nobody is sure how. The Russians thought they were being slick while massing forces in three different spots along the border. Mm. But Dudayev knew exactly what they were doing. The only thing that is known that it is very possible somewhere very high up in Russian intelligence a leak was occurring going from the Kremlin to the generals on the ground straight to Dudayev's ears. Now, we know that someone thinks this occurred because a member of the state, Duma, is like, oh yeah, everybody was leaking shit. What? They're selling that shit? I think that's a possibility. I mean, there's also a lot of other stuff. Remember, Dudayev wasn't just some dude. He was a Soviet Air Force general. He had friends. He probably called in a favor. Uh, all right. Uh, Shamil Basayev might be just a, like a bloodthirsty monster. Dudayev was a, a, a Soviet guy for a very long time. He had to have friends in the KGB or the FSB. I believe it's called the FSK at the time. Russians really like their abbreviations. It's a 100% chance that somebody was leaking. Nobody's sure why. But I'm going to bet it's because Dudayev knew a guy. I mean, remember, everybody involved in the Chechen separatist government is some form or another a former Soviet officer or political officer. Like, all of these dudes have friends who are still in very high up places in Russia. It's like the Soviet war. People would sit, literally sell the Mujahideen their rifle, knowing they'd be shot by it. <laughs> like, they didn't care. They wanted money and they wanted a way out. So, like, there's prob Dudayev probably bribed people. He made a lot of money in the black market, too. Maybe he called in favors. I don't know. Corruption is rampant at all levels of, of the Russian government and high levels of the military and also low levels of the military. <laughs> it's just all around. <laughs> it's one of those situations where like this could have happened so many ways and nobody's sure how. <laughs> and nobody's talking for reasons we'll talk about. But there was at no point that the Russians surprised Dudayev with any move that they made because he knew. But while Dudayev couldn't do anything to save his air force, he could prepare his ground forces for the coming invasion. Now, the Russian army didn't invade Chechnya. Fucking everybody did. And, and what I mean is the entire Russian security apparatus invaded Chechnya. There's no good way to put this other than just like it inherited a bloated nightmare of agencies from the USSR and had done absolutely nothing to streamline them. That meant... There was countless different police agencies, internal ministries, intelligence agencies that also had their own ground forces, the Navy, the Air Force, the Army. It's fucking wild. 
<laughs> There's so many different agencies involved in this. Like it's an all-star game or some shit. No, because all-star uh, requires talent. Uh, these guys had none of that. All right. I will say this, because since we're both people who like sports, you know how you watch an all-star game and they kind of suck at playing together? Yeah. Yeah. It's because they they have no teamwork. They don't want to coordinate together. And in fact, a lot of them probably dislike one another. Absolutely. It's exactly what happened here. <laughs> the federal government did not put any kind of coordination agency or liaison system in place for these dozens of agencies to speak or coordinate or plan with one another. They all had their own command structures, and absolutely none of them work together. <laughs> Finely tuned machine. Now, it's very common for different military branches to have friendly rivalries, right? We're both familiar with that. People listening yeah. are probably familiar with that, like Army and Marines. We'll make fun of each other, obviously, because Marines are stupid. But, <laughs> 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 but like when we have to go invade something, like, yeah, whatever, we're working with Marines. Like, it's a friendly rivalry. It's not real. I mean, we're we're this, have the same fucking job most of the time. Yeah, like, we're not going to murder each other, right? Unless it's like that guy in Africa, the Green Beret that got strangled to death by a whole bunch of seals and Marine oh, Raiders. Oh yeah, but that was not a rivalry. That was over money. <laughs> I thought I, it was I'm over drugs sure. and money. I think it was drug money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the case in Russia. The police agencies all hated one another, and everyone else. The internal ministries hated the ground forces, and the ground forces hated everyone, including themselves. <laughs> None of the different agencies would talk or work together. And in many cases, units within the same branch also hated each other. Say, two companies within the same battalion would refuse to march together. Solid. This is certainly how I would plan an invasion. I want everybody oh, yeah. to fucking hate one another. Now direct that hate that way. <laughs> you, know how, you know how you really want to shoot the guy next to you? How about you shoot Chechens instead? Now, when orders came down to invade, all hell broke loose. As you can imagine from the 800 different command structures at play here. Some units refused to march. Soldiers deserted because they had no idea where they were or what the fuck they were doing there. <laughs> like, remember, some of these guys, like, you could quite honestly be thousands and thousands of miles away from home and have never fucking heard of Chechnya before. Right. They're like, where am I? Is that in Russia? Why the fuck are we here? Fuck this. I'm going home. And people just fucking desert. Also, a lot of them are from neighboring republics, like other Muslim majority republics that also kind of sort of had designs and independence and had a lot of cultural things in common with Chechens. They're like, yeah, fuck this. I'm going home. Uh, other units set out, scared other units uh, that had gotten no orders, causing them to shoot at one another. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Other times, uh, units just start shooting at one another because they didn't like each other. Like, how does that start? I, I just assumed, like, hey, we got uh, we got war orders now. They didn't say against who. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not understanding how that starts. I assume it was like a minor disagreement over money or whatever. I don't know. Heated Uno game. <laughs> Playing spades and someone just fucking starts spraying AK ammo at somebody. This is why I don't play spades. Fucking hate that game. I enjoy it. Now, in one circumstances, civilians in neighboring Ungesheria began to protest, knowing exactly where all of these soldiers were going, right? And they stopped an armored convoy from moving by standing in front of it, kind of like daring them to run it over, which I don't know if that's a game I'd play with the Russian army. And then they eventually began throwing firebombs at the vehicles, setting them on fire. The soldiers manning them deserted, leaving the burning vehicles and all of the ammunition to civilians. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you can have it. Fuck this. I'm going home. Yeah. That's just the whole thing. I'm going home. Other units saw this and decided the best way to get out of all of this mess would just be simply to sabotage their vehicles so they couldn't leave it all. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do a war if you don't got a BMP, motherfucker. Just blowing <laughs> tracks off of each other's vehicles. Now, some units did move out like they were supposed to. Oh, one of those square units. Fucking losers. Nerds. <laughs> gonna follow orders. Uh, Any uh, minor inconvenience, I'm going home. <laughs> I swear to God, the second one of these guys looks at me wrong, I'm gonna shoot myself in the foot. <laughs> uh, the invasion plan was like something that, I don't know, kids would come up with playing like soldiers in the backyard or whatever. It was like quite literally three different convoys all of them going in different directions and all of them would end up in grozny at the same time that was all of the plan there was no plan for any of the countless dozens of villages between point a and point b it's just like get to point b fuck it dude what if we run into 
resistance. Just keep driving. Don't worry about it. I'm like, uh, okay. An officer that would get captured by the Chechen said, like, their orders were just like advance. Like, advance where? Just advance. <laughs> All right. Go. It, it's like what happens in a, in a real situation when those war movies, they're like, charge! Like, where? It's the whole field in front of, like, which, where are we going? Shut up and do it. You're ruining my speech. I'm going home. Yeah, I'm charging the other way. I'm not retreating. Like I said, some units did move out. Even in places that had one spin, like Dudaev's opposition, like there were some villages that never quite fell under Dudaev's control as the president. When they saw Russians invading, they decided they were actually pretty cool to die. Of. <laughs> They're like, oh, really? yeah, because like, you know, they hate Dudaev, but they still want to be independent. Oh, OK. I thought they'd be down for the Russians coming over. It's like when you hate the president, like, sure, you want you hate the president, but you also you don't want to be a colony of the United Kingdom anymore. Like, <laughs> you don't want to go back in time. Like, no, we're, we're fine with independence, actually. That guy is just the dickhead. That goes back to one of our favorite theories in this entire show. And that is the general theory of fuck that guy. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, So everybody aligns themselves with Dudaev. Soon civilians and fighters who hated Dudaev saw him as the defender of their homeland, standing against the Russian aggression, trundling down their goddamn streets. Fighters launched organized defenses against the Russians, while civilians blocked the streets with their own bodies, throwing rocks and bricks at everything else they could get their hands on. They're braver than me, because I feel like a Russian would say, I don't really have much to lose. I might just run you over. It really seems like their patience ran out when the civilians in Ungusheria blocked through. Because at this time, the Russians responded by just blindly firing in every direction. They blew up and bombed pretty much every building or house that they saw. This was mostly out of fear. You remember, all these guys are panicked conscripts giving a loaded weapon for the first time and no training whatsoever. Yeltsin ordered the army to show restraint, but nobody ever trained them on what restraint was. Like... Right. It was just a death blossom with fully automatic weapons in every direction. Like, this might sound weird to people who have never been in the military or don't have any knowledge of military training, but you do have to teach soldiers how not to kill people, too. Otherwise, you end up with, I don't know, Eddie Gallagher. Uh, like, you have to teach them, like, how not to shoot people and how to de-escalate situations and also what a threat looks like and what it doesn't look like. And also, what the laws are regarding who you shoot and who you can't shoot. They didn't have any of that at all. None. Just like, here's a belt-fed weapon. Kid, go get him. You're doing great. Panic conscripts with virtually no training shot everything that moved. While a lot of these uh, hit-and-run formations that the Chechens deployed resisted the invasion, it was little more than a constant delaying action, right? They're, they're not digging trenches in the street and going toe-to-toe with Russia. They're operating in pretty small groups. Now, the Russians penetrated within 25 kilometers of the capital of Grozny. Now, according to uh, Chechen Colonel Hussein Ishkanov, who did a pretty lengthy interview, weirdly enough, the plan was to dig in and defend the capital in the city center. But they needed more time and wanted more time to prepare. That is uh, when Aslan Mashkadov, which is a former Red Army artillery officer, got a brilliant fucking idea. See... At this point, the Chechens had been worried that the Russians would simply bomb them if they arrayed themselves on a force-in-force battle. This is due to a lack of firepower. They lacked modern anti-aircraft systems. So like, mm. if we array all of our artillery out in the open, we'll just get bombed into submission. We can't do that. So right. they would deploy their artillery in a different way. Uh, <laughs> so Mashkadov thought a very good idea would be to simply hide the rockets. These are being grad multiple rocket launch systems in the woods outside of the town of Dolinsky, where he would hide them in, in very, very, very dense forests. And Russians weren't exactly using advanced targeting systems, so they couldn't really see them. And instead of having them park miles upon miles away from battle and then you know, using them as indirect fire artillery weapons, he would point them directly at the street where the Russians were coming from and point oh, blank them fuck. with artillery. <laughs> <laughs> all of the now mind you these rockets are like 155 millimeters They're Jesus, huge and he can fire dozens of them in rapid succession that's fucking overkill it's, it's brilliant like i never thought like i assumed you couldn't use them that way for some reason you know when russian vehicles begin to drive down the road mashkadov unle- unleashed several batteries of missiles at point blank range you know how terrifying that would be? You'll, on the bright side is you only feel the fear for a second before your body is just melted by the incoming rocket. 
Imagine being the survivor. I'm going home. <laughs> Throw the vehicle in reverse. You guys can have Chechnya. Seems like a great <laughs> place. Bye. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, they just uh, got a fucking annihilate. Hundreds of soldiers were killed. And then the fighters within the town began shooting at them as well. Oh, uh, yeah. No, fuck that. This is also something that the Chechens use this as a learning opportunity. And that is the Russian Air Force had no ability, want or desire to give close air support to the ground forces. Because they didn't like each other? There's that. And I think a lot of it is they simply were afraid to get close do like close air support but also yeah, look at that new tactic they just came up with <laughs> i really don't feel like catching a rocket to my face who knows what they got for us in modern militaries you have the ability to call in airstrikes from forward observers and things like that or just loitering aircraft you have the ability to communicate with those aircrafts and call in airstrikes the russians didn't they said it like the most ground forces did not have the ability to speak to any kind of air power that includes helicopters some did, but oh. overall, most did not. So, like, if a jet was loitering overhead and dropping bombs, you just had to be like, I really hope they don't hit us. Uh, no, good fuck. luck, buddy. But, uh, spoiler alert, that happens a lot. Uh, the Russians bomb themselves frequently. Oh. Almost as much as they bomb the Chechens. Did they not know what was going on? Uh, the Air Force? Like... Oh, okay. Never mind. You you already said that they didn't talk to each other. No, they did not. Uh, and they had no, and the Air Force had no desire to fix that. Like they, they again, like most people, they believe that like oh, those fucking conscripts are below us. Who gives a shit? They just didn't care. One of the more overarching things that really dawned on me while reading this is like very few people in the Russian military actually gave a shit about soldiers at all. <laughs> Like even I heard even as humans, even as to soldiers, yeah, even as humans, like, I, and I understand that like everybody in the military has a shitty leader at some point, um, but like just an absolute disregard for life is impressive. You don't see that often, and it seems to be a common strain amongst most uh, outside of like very very junior leaders. Like, because obviously these people are people; they know each other, they work together. At a squad and platoon level, they're, I'm sure they're all friends because soldiers are soldiers throughout history. But once you go on to the larger picture, just nobody gives a shit. <laughs> it's kind of incredible. After that, the Russians decided, that, well, moving forward is hard, right? We need to get behind this. We need, we need mm. to fight these guys on their level. We need to expand our advance in a different way. That way, they can't just target these three positions. So they went to an airborne operation. 50 paratroopers were dropped behind enemy lines with the mission of setting up a landing zone that could be used to ferry in more paratroopers, as well as hunt down and destroy an arms depot that was reported to be in the area. To be fair, that probably would have hurt the Chechens if such an arms depot existed. <laughs> it did not. I had no idea where they got the intelligence from, but when Chechens heard about it, it's like, we didn't have any arms depot. All of our ammo was captured from you. They were like Sweet. frighteningly low on ammo with like a lot of fighters going with like half of a magazine. The first thing they would do was just rob the shit out of Russian bodies and vehicles that were left behind uh, because they just didn't have anything. Right. Because remember, it's been years since this whole thing started. This started in 1991 when USSR fell. And since then, the vast quantities of ammunition that Chechnya did once had had been expended on each other. Uh, so like these huge depots of arms that they should have are all mostly burned up in what at this point is pretty much a civil war up until that point. Mm. So like, yeah, everybody has guns and vehicles and, and ship. They're like, we have no gas or bullets or like, and, and like one of the things that uh, I scan off talks about is like, we had artillery. We didn't have any fucking ammo for it. We could have used our artillery. Like we used the rockets, but each gun had like five shots and we'd be out. So they used them instead to build like IEDs, which is had a much better uh, effect at like denying the Russians uh, roads. Oh, I imagine their offensive was almost explicitly confined to roads because they were using tanks and APCs and stuff. So like, oh, well, let's blow them up. They're on the order, order of go. So. Yeah. Advance. But yeah, so this paratroop operation to the mysterious arms depot that did not exist. Yeah, I still feel like the 50 uh, is probably not enough. It's not nearly enough. The Russian plan was to set up and get a hold at the front and they could just ferry soldiers in. So like, I guess for clearing an area they believed to be easy, 50 people would be enough. 
maybe. I don't know. Of course, since you're listening to the show and this episode, you probably know that isn't what happened. There's already the possibility of leaks blowing this plan that we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. Uh, Though It's kind of unknown if an operation this small would have been leaked because it was made independent of the Kremlin, which happens quite frequently. Just commanders on the ground doing whatever the fuck they want. One of the common refrains of, of the just the sheer amount of contempt that a lot of these officers and enlisted men and conscripts had for the government was like they called them the whores in Moscow or like the Kremlin brothel and shit like that. Military officers thought Yeltsin was a fucking idiot. They thought Grachev was a fucking idiot, which like they both were. But to the point that they didn't even bother running their plans by them anymore. <laughs> and that went both ways. So like you could see that could be a problem. Let's say the leak didn't happen. So the Chechens don't know the paratroopers are coming. But you want to know what they did see. A whole bunch of dudes floating down from the sky connected to parachutes in broad daylight. Oh, in broad daylight. Yep. Yep. No okay. need to do that at night, Nick. No, no, no. Everybody within miles saw them slowly floating down to the earth, which is not good for your secret mission. No. We're still there dropped directly into a forest, which if you're unaware of how paratrooping works, which I'm not, I'm not airborne. Nick is an airborne, but I do know being dropped into trees sucks. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh so people got people got like stuck up in trees, they fell through breaking their limbs, you know, shit like that. I think one guy died. It's kind of up in the air of how this whole thing ended. According to one of their officer, Major General Igor Morozov. Sorry, Major Igor. He wasn't a general. He's just a major. He said that there was a firefight leading to two people being killed. Civilians say that there was no firefight. The paratroopers and the two people who were killed were killed because they fucked up their landing, landed into a tree, then the tree broke, whatever. There was no firefight, according to the civilians. But it was cold and raining and miserable outside. Because remember, it's December in fucking Russia, right? The soldiers were not giving any kind of waterproof clothing and had very limited rations. They also were not wearing winter boots. Mm. Major Morozov attempted to radio back to the headquarters telling them all of these problems and how their mission was going to shit, but they were ignored. The mission was only supposed to last three days, but Morozov knew everyone in the area had to know where they were, so there was no way for them to complete their mission. He ordered his men to just hide, and they would wait for the helicopters to come pick them up. So this is like that junior leader like actually giving a shit about his people situation right. that we talked about. Now, when three days passed, the helicopters still did not show up, abandoning them in the woods. I kind of felt like that was going to happen. Yeah. Now, the Russians say that they was simply delayed for another couple of days because of weather. Uh, Morozov disagrees with that. And that's when a group of civilians found them. Morozov knows that they're armed with little more than hunting rifles. And many of them are kids and old people. So Morozov ordered his soldiers to simply surrender to them. Now, Morozov was a veteran of the Afghan war. And he said that when he saw who the Chechens were, he realized immediately what they were doing. And he didn't want to take part because like he'd never fucking met a Chechen before. Most of these guys haven't. Right. Though the Chechens got a little too confident in their ability to go toe to toe with the Russians after winning everything so far at this point. The Russian forces moved into Kanakala Airfield, uh, an old, which was an old Soviet airbase that had fallen into disrepair on the outskirts of Grozny. The Chechens launched a full-scale counterattack using tanks, APCs, and infantry. Now, this, it turns out, happened to be the one thing that the Russians were good at. Well, that's good. <laughs> it's a straight-up armor battle and on an open plane. The Russians and the tanks also suffering from a deficit of training and, and stuff like that, but... Their deficit of training was still more than what the Chechens had, which was none. Uh, So, you know, they won. The Chechens weren't necessarily destroyed as much as they simply called off the attack, realizing that they weren't going to be able to chase off these guys. They lost several of their tanks in the process, though um, one of them pointed out that there really was no point of keeping them. They had no fuel for the motherfuckers anyway. (laughs) (laughs) The decision was made to pull all the way back to the capital of Grozny, and fighters and civilians went to work welding together tank obstacles with the local factory's equipment. And they made thousands of these fucking things, like hedgehogs and stuff like that. Yeah. What they were trying to do was funnel them in directions they wanted the tanks to go. Because the Russians had accidentally given the Chechens experience fighting tanks in close urban combat. Remember their botched proxy invasion back in November? So they learned a lot. They knew their best bet was funneling them into the city center, where the roads were very narrow and the buildings were very close together and tall. Not to mention, they had basement windows and sewers and stuff. Now, while the Chechens assumed that the Russians would keep up this you know, straightforward advance and just burst right into the city, they didn't. Uh, they actually encircled it on December 20th. 
over a week after Gratchoff said that the war would already be over, in case you're keeping track. Oh, what a dick. <laughs> but they did an absolutely terrible job encircling the city. Now, one of the keys of encircling a city is these cordons are supposed to be secure, right? People, nobody right. in or out. You know, can't use them smuggling or out. Seems like that would never fucking happen. And actually, larger than that, that would never happen for Chechnya in general. One of the things that I used was a, a staff college paper that uh, I believe it was a colonel or, or a major or a lieutenant colonel, something like that, wrote. And he's in staff college for the U.S. military. It was like his uh, takeaways of, of the failures of the Russian war. And one of them was like they completely lack the ability to, uh, I'm trying to remember how you put it, like command the war zone, like command their space. Because at mm. no point did they actually like blockade off Chechnya enough to stop any influx of fighters or outflux of fighters. They never really sealed off any city. So like they never really commanded anything unless they're currently bombing it, which is going to be a problem when you're trying to encircle a city, right? Chechens found it very easy to leave and enter the city at will. This meant more and more fighters from around the Republic would stream into the city and pool their resources together from around the entire Republic into the planned battle. Remember, this is like from the beginning, like we're going to fight them in Grozny. Everything else is a sideshow. This is where the fight is. Because at this point, there's only like 200 fighters in the city against like tens of thousands really? of, of Russian soldiers. I thought there'd be more. That's the thing is like there would be eventually that they would eventually blow up to like 5,000, maybe. Jesus. And that's the thing. These numbers are not accurate. It's one of the, the Chechen commanders points out that they only can be certain of the soldiers that would come in and check into what they considered their headquarters, which was with Dudaev, right? Or with Dudaev's commanders. So like that is how the, Nash, the Chechen National Guard kept track of how many people and who was in charge of who. But Almost immediately, that isn't the case. Remember, you have people like Shamil Bashayev, who's technically working with the government, but he's working for himself. There's dozens of different warlords that command their own militias, totally independent of any state control. So some people say that there was a thousand fighters in the city. Some people say there was 5,000. Now, 5,000 is the highest estimate, and they are encircled by tens of thousands of Russian soldiers not to mention hundreds of tanks and APCs and helicopters and jets. So low level 1,000, high level 5,000, somewhere in the middle, I'm going to guess. Gotcha. Not to mention all of the civilians, right? There's still civilians in the city. They have nowhere to go. They're surrounded by Russians who are not letting them leave. So like a lot of guys who weren't fighters or kids, mostly too, there's a lot of children involved in this. Now, the children did, weren't fed up and grabbing a rifle because these kids, some of these kids are like 12 years old, but you know, they were armed and put out on the line. But also old men, some women, very limited amount of women were like, you know, I'm sick of getting bombed and shit, too. Give me a fucking rifle. So like soon they're pretty much fighting the entire city uh, because while all of this is going on, the Russians are just shelling and bombing the city mercilessly, like indiscriminate carpet bombing. Uh, so people get mad. Mm. Now, this defense was a mix of Chechen National Guard, uh, militias from independent various warlords. Now, the training level was really just all over the place. Obviously, like we talked about before, the National Guard has Soviet-era training because that's where they were born from, right? All of their officers and NCOs are Soviet vets. A lot of the soldiers are as well. Then you have internationalist militias like Shamil Basayev, who received training from places like Pakistan, Azerbaijan, and also Russia once. Oh, nice. <laughs> it was during the, uh, the Ossetian War against uh, the Republic of Georgia, Russia sat with the Ossetians. And they're like, hey, this guy Shamil wants to fight for you guys. We'll give him training. Like He trained with was effectively the KGB and then would eventually end up fighting them. Oh, Thankfully, wow. us as Americans have know nothing about that kind of thing ever <laughs> happening to us. Basayev's fighters were not just Chechens. There's also Georgians. There's Afghans. There was Azeris. There's Turks. Various other groups of people he managed to pick up over the years. There's also even a weird Ukrainian nationalist militia involved. Which, really? if you're not looking at a map, they're fucking lost. Uh, <laughs> they're, they call themselves the Ukrainian National Assembly. This almost certainly has to do with just the deep-seated hatred for Russians. I just thought because they were bored. <laughs> Crash this party. You know, of all of the former Soviet republics, you know, obviously Ukraine's having a war now, but they weren't having one then. They're like, we're missing out. Let's go across the border and find one, guys. Yeah, they're war tourists or something. I don't know. 
a lot of it is just like anti-Russian solidarity through people who just really had some bad fe- memories of the Soviet Union, which to be fair, if anybody would, it would be Ukraine. So <laughs> like, of course, I could see that. Yeah. Now, as the Chechens built up and dug in, so did the Russians for a siege. They, they carpet bombed and indiscriminately shelled the entire city. Some of this could be because they lacked what we would consider smart munitions or guided missiles to specifically target defenders. But another theory is they're hoping that they could brutalize the civilians within the city so badly they would turn against the government. Uh, by the government, I mean Dudayev. But I think a lot of it is just they're dicks. I don't think there's a higher calling here in their, in their, in their strategy. But if anybody's ever looked at a situation quite like this before, that's not how that works. You cannot drive people apart by brutalizing them. You drive them closer together through shared trauma and violence and hatred towards you by bombing oh, yeah. them. Yeah. It rallied the population around the fighters even more. And this only amplified when the Russians began to purposefully target residential areas with missile strikes. Mm. But none of this kept the Chechens down. During the daylight, they stayed indoors, underground, or in sewers and basements to escape the bombardments. But at night, they took to ambushing the Russian positions on the outskirts of the city. Now remember, this is all made easier by the fact that virtually every Chechen uh, had served at the Red Army. So they knew exactly how the Russians would array and prepare themselves in a situation quite like this. They would know how they would dig in. They knew how they would defend. Because... They were trained to do that, too. Right. Also, they all knew Russian fluently because they had to learn it. This is only a couple years removed from them being part of the Soviet school system, which forced the Russian language onto everyone in the Soviet Union. So, I mean, that was their fluent language. They spoke Chechen as well, which the two are not compatible. So, like, they could speak Chechen to one another over the radio or in close by to Russian soldiers. And the Russians would have no idea what they're saying. but. They could also speak Russian virtually unaccented. Like they learned Russian, like Moscow Russian. So like, oh, wow. So the Chechens would sneak out at night, get close to the Russians using their own language and tactics, begin ambushing and confusing them where they lived and slept. That's a kick in the dick. Yeah. They would like walk up to positions acting like they were the relief and calling out to them in Russian. And the guy would get out of the bunker and they just shoot him. God, that would suck. Yeah, it fucking blows. I-, I imagine that would happen in like most civil wars. I'm sure the Syrian civil war has seen several different shades of this. Same with the Ukrainian one. But like your normal Russian conscript from St. Petersburg or Moscow is going to have no fucking idea that his enemy could probably speak his language too. Right. Or also that they're my enemy because he doesn't know where he is. (laughs) Now, when this happened, the only thing the Russian commanders did in response was to shell Grozny harder or the nearby town of Argon. So like they'd get ambushed and like, fuck you, and just launch missiles at a nearby city just to spite them. Speak this language. Yeah. Now, on the ground, they sowed panic and confusion amongst the Russian soldiers in their positions. So like instead of hearing someone call out and they're like, hey, bro, I'm coming to relieve you. They just fucking gun them down. What? Anything in the middle of the night would get shot at because they thought they were going to be ambushed by Chechens. They would routinely... Did you imagine it was actually their relief? It was a lot. Jesus Christ. Like They were shooting at everything that was moving. Like a Chechen fighter remarked that they would be sitting in the city at night and they'd be hearing guns go off in the perimeter knowing that they're not out there fucking with the Russians and they have to be shooting each other out of confusion. Like they've sowed so much panic in the ranks that like, Everyone in a foxhole is looking not just like towards the city, but like 360 degrees. <laughs> hey, did we plan an attack tonight? No. Ooh. <laughs> Broke fighting the enemy. Woke making the enemy fight themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that meme where he's tapping his head like you don't have to fight the enemy if you convince them to shoot each other. Yeah. Now, after shelling the city blindly, it was time for the ground assault to begin. On New Year's Day, the Battle of Grozny began. And that is where we will pick up next week. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> Nick, how you feeling about uh, being, a, being a Russian soldier right about now? Oh, fucking awful. I would, I would have shot myself in the foot fucking days I would have been before. At home. I would have not have lasted long enough to end up in the outskirts of Grozny. Like, no. The first sign of Chechen shooting at me, I'm running back over the border and throwing my fucking uniform off like it's on fire. As soon as I hear stories of, yeah, rockets came out of the trees. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard no for me. Are these bushes speaking Russian? <laughs> yeah. But Nick, that is part two. Join us 
next week for part three, the first Battle of Grozny, because my friends, there are so many. There are so many Battles of Grozny and all of them are bad. I don't believe it. Nick, thank you, as always, for joining me. Everybody, thank you for listening and supporting the show. And until next time, learn how to use a rocket launcher that is meant to be indirect directly. And if... Can I say that? (laughs) Oh, yeah, I can say that. Oh, don't be in the Russian army? Don't don't be in the Russian army. All right, fine. One last time. (laughs) 